Welcome to Brain Junk. I'm Amy Barton. And I'm Trace Kerr. I was in the grocery store the other day and there was this guy with a three foot stock of dill and they were clearly going to do some pickling and he shows it to me and we're chatting about it and he said he sent a selfie with the dill with to his wife and he's like, I told her I'm kind of a big deal. And so knowing we were doing this podcast, I was curious what dill stands for and it does stand for sort of a lusty. So maybe that was sort of a flirty text and he just didn't know it, but we know now. We totally know (laughs) now. So the language of flowers is super fun. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about Everything you never knew you wanted to know about floriography. When we think about flowers and their symbolic meanings, most Western culture looks to Victorian society, right? Mm-hmm. And their use of flowers to pass messages. You know, we've seen that in literature and art and things like that. Well, interestingly, many of the flowers that they were sending to each other are not native to Europe and the United States. Mm -hmm. So your tulips, your crocus, chrysanthemum, daffodils, hyacinth, I mean, the list is incredibly long. They're all from the Middle East and China. Many of the meanings of these flowers came to the West with the plants themselves. That makes sense. Yeah. So instead of starting and talking about Victorian era flower usage. Where it all bloomed. (laughs) Which there is a lot of information about that on the internet and out there in the world. Finding stuff that's older. I mean, you'd see Mm -hmm. translated from Turkish, translated from this. I wanted to dig into Chinese pottery. So since the Song Dynasty, that's 960, that's like 3,000 years ago, flowers have been among the most popular decorative themes. So you have, well, I have a picture of one on the website, and then there's a link to a Christie's auction of Mm -hmm. ancient pottery. Peonies, jasmine, chrysanthemum, and other flowers are all over their pottery. I never thought about those as being exotic because we've got them in our gardens now, and they're hardy in but uh, that does make sense that they're not they're not from here they're not and at the time you know no one had seen them but well there there mm-hmm. they were seeing them one of the main pottery flowers was the tree peony you see peonies that are kind of Bush shrubs mm-hmm. yes but you can also get one that has like a tree trunk and it keeps really? growing it gets bigger and the giant peonies on it And it was considered a king flower, so it was associated with the imperial family, a flower of wealth and honor. So Mm -hmm. you see that repeated often on the pottery. Oh. Same with uh, hibiscus, wealth and glory. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, different and tea. Yes, and different <laughs> flowers would be used on the same vase because, so here's an interesting thing with Chinese characters, unlike the alphabet that we have, mm-hmm. you can, you know, a character might mean one thing in this word, but if you take that character and you put it in another word, it means something the else. changes. Yes. Okay. And if you mix and match a lot of the flowers together... When you put the different flowers together, so you've got a tree peony and you've got your hibiscus, Mm -hmm. the Chinese characters, it changes the whole meaning of a word or phrase. Okay. So there's layers of meanings. We're not just, you know, we're showing you the flower, but then depending on which flowers are together, that also means something else. That is very complicated. (laughs) It's super complicated. And that's about as much as I can explain of it. I come from the cultural heritage where... Purple means royalty. There you go. (laughs) Done. It's it's simpler. It's very straightforward and direct. (laughs) Yes. And the, oh, and another fun one was the camellia, red blooms. Mm -hmm. Well, red is a color of prosperity and the camellia meant joy and protection. It was associated with the new year. So depending on, you know, when you would Mm -hmm. be getting it or giving it and all these kind of things on their pottery. We've got poinsettias. They would have camellias. Yes. And the flower thing was not just on pottery. There was an emperor who had a banquet. Now, this is a, we think this happened. He had a banquet, and all the women had to wear real flowers. Mm -hmm. And then they were going to let a butterfly go. Whoever the butterfly landed on, that was who was going to get to spend the night with the emperor. I'm not sure how I would choose my flowers. Like, you go to the butterfly garden and... (laughs) Which one are they not landing on? I mean, That's I don't exactly know. what I'm thinking. He, he might have been a really charming fellow. It was probably yeah. a giant honor. But uh, yeah, mm-hmm. the meaning of flowers is it's all over the place. I wonder if they had like, this is my carnation outfit. And so today it means back off. I'm super crabby. When we talk about the Victorian era, yes. there were dictionaries. Well, that's because both parts of the world have a long history using flowers and symbols. When Europeans jumped into the language of flowers and turned it into a Western fad, texts from places like Turkey, 
Mm -hmm. and uh, parts of the Middle East were being translated by different people into French and into English to define what flowers meant. Mm -hmm. And the Victorians had their pocketbook flower dictionaries because there were lots of mixed messages going around. So I have an example (laughs) of that, a modern example. So for us, a chrysanthemum, Mm -hmm. during the fall, we usually have... These chrysanthemums, I mean, if you go to Home Depot, they go nuts. that's all we've got is yeah. chrysanthemums. And they're yellow and brown and red and, and orange. And... and people put them out on their porches, you know, as yeah. a celebration. Well, in China, white and yellow mums are funeral flowers. <laughs> we wear, You know, they wear white at funerals. Uh-huh. And these are so, you know, oh. here's a mixed message. I show up and I'm going to visit you and you've just moved here from China and I bring oh. you this giant bouquet of mums in the fall because it's our last big bloom of the year yeah that's not going to go over well (laughs) someone's going to be offended (laughs) yes for sure yeah leave those on the porch please Mm -hmm. because uh, not their porch yeah they're dead flowers and we don't want those here yeah, although that's very Halloween Day of the Dead. I like that connection. Well, that's true, but I guess if you didn't know that, you know, you no. would just be kind of uncomfortable. Yes, we're having a, a translation issue there. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so now you had a lady who was writing one of these uh, Victorian dictionaries, right? Yes, and I think it might be time to get bifocals. I just had to take my glasses off to be able to read what I have. Oh, no. (laughs) Lady Mary Wortley Montague, she was a feminist poet who married an English ambassador to Turkey. And they moved to Turkey in the early, the 1717 to 19 season. And so she's riding home back and forth and she's experiencing Turkish culture and she's sharing it with her family. So this returned with her. She wrote a lot about this language of flowers, and then when she returned, it became a much bigger thing. And I can see why, because there was not a lot of back and forth with the Asian countries. Travel was difficult, and it was a very closed and romanticized society. Harems seemed sexy, and the flowers were exotic, and there were secret messages between lovers. And so she's Mm. describing this very exotic thing to women in the 1700s, where corsets, things like that, and... (laughs) So it was wanted, so different. They wanted a little bit of that romanticized. The Orientalism was yeah. super popular. Because you know, they were covering their smallpox scars with mooshes. And... That's right. <laughs> and then they're like, hey, let's wear a turban and give yes. each other roses and mm-hmm. they'll be all romantic. Yeah. So in a very mannered and repressing society for women, I totally see why that was exotic and and exciting. But not. it doesn't seem like a ton of the actual original Turkish has come from that. I think it takes a lot of work to dig in and find that original Asian heritage and that original Asian. This is what it really meant. One author said that they kind of thought she really either misunderstood a lot of what was truly the Turkish culture around that or romanticized it because now what you see versus what you would have seen, what this researcher came up with. And so they seem to have taken a ball and rolled with it big time. This is another prime example of cultural appropriation, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Where Western culture, yay, yet again. Mm -hmm, Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) We find something we like, we twist a little and yay. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and I forgot to tell you that fun, interesting, lots of my information comes from Romy Stott, who wrote for Atlas Obscura. She wrote a great article, which we will have in our show notes. Excellent. Mm-hmm. The fortunate thing, if I were to have lived in this time, is there was definitely a class distinction with this language of flowers and the use. It was definitely a higher, everybody used it, it sounds like, but it was much more expansive and it was a big thing in the high class, in the upper class people, the middle class and the poor class surviving, doing daily life, milking the cows, getting things done, didn't have the time or the means for this. Hmm. So I don't... I find it all a little bit like, whoa, overwhelming. (laughs) I don't think I would have to deal with it. (laughs) So that's happy for me. Uh, I know. Amy (laughs) texted me. What did you say that uh, you were asking about definitions of different things? And then you said (laughs) that you thought you'd just wind up lonely and alone because this was just too much effort. And I said, no, you can grow flowers for your cats. (laughs) (laughs) They would be completely unpicky if I got it wrong. Here's a bouquet of catnip. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. They would be so happy with me. Well, by 1810, the French had been putting out flower almanacs. They were sort of a coffee table book with sort of a combination farmer's almanac. Very beautiful. Had some about flowers. Well, as this 
language of floriography started becoming of interest, they tacked on addendum on the back, like a dictionary of flower meetings. And that was kind of the first introduction into printed material where it was added to this almanac. But it quickly exploded into a whole edition of its own. Between 1827 and 1923, there were at least 98 different flower dictionaries in circulation. And that's in the U.S. And so in Europe, I'm sure it was bigger. I'm a huge Jane Austen fan. Mm -hmm. And in there, a small bouquet would come or someone would be given a small bouquet. And the first thing they do is go (laughs) for the tiny little maybe three by four inch book and they're flipping through it and everyone's like, Mm -hmm. oh, it's a wallflower. What does that mean? You know, and how did what combine together? What do they mean? Yeah. all, and and so much, well, we're just creating another way to have some angst over something. You oh, know? It yeah. Can't <laughs> just be, it can't just be a bouquet, you know. Well, there's three branches of baby's breath. Does that mean he likes me or does that mean he likes me, you know? Yeah. He sent the side eye emoji. What does that mean? I know. <laughs> Oh, we're still doing it. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I read one blurb that said, too, in literature, it was such a big deal. And you would read in Jane Eyre and Charlotte Bronte. If you were reading it, you kind of had to understand this language of flowers because she says that in a Charlotte Bronte book, Jane looks at snowdrops, crocuses, purple auriculas, and golden-eyed pansies in Chapter 9. She's feeling hopeful, cheerful, modest, and preoccupied with the connection between money and happiness. That's what you were supposed to understand from that sentence, that she's looking at these flowers. And so that's how she was feeling. I would miss entire subtext in books. Uh, but they knew. But they, <laughs> they knew. knew. It's just yeah. like now, if you get you a winky it. face or you got that right? face with the tears coming out of it, well, you know they're yeah. laughing or they're crying. Or, yeah. Yeah. Is this the praise Jesus hands or the touchdown? Of uh, course. Which is it? <laughs> well, and then, <laughs> and then you've got probably that generational thing where the young people are in it and they know like a yes. snapdragon means this. And us older people are like, well, it's yellow. So that means it's pretty. And they're like, yes, oh, you just <laughs> sent him a flower that says I want to get married. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. It's like when Good news, I bad news. Accidentally sent a peach to somebody, and they were like, "That's a butt. What are you doing?" And I was like, "Oh, I summer fruit, green I, bluff." I was, yeah, I know. I was like, it's, "Sometimes a peach is just a peach." <laughs> Exactly. (laughs) Not in Victorian era England. The sending of actual bouquets was something that was definitely confined to the upper class. But interesting timing because at this Victorian era, which is 1837 to 1901, the reign of Victoria, that was also the big bloom of technology changed a lot, transportation changed, and ready cash. You had people who suddenly are making money hand over fist. And so families have opportunity to travel to the Far East to get these flowers. It's easier now. It's not so closed. They have the money to build giant greenhouses and they've got time to kill to do it all. And they had the opportunity now to create these exotic big bouquets and have these huge greenhouses and conservatories, unfortunately, many of which were torn down in World War One era for the war effort. There's one in Sheffield, apparently, but not something that continues to exist a lot in England. That's kind of the end of it for the Victorian era. Well, the language of flowers has, I mean, we still kind of do it today. I don't think we so much think about if I send my mom a flower bouquet, she's not checking to Mm -hmm. see if I'm telling her that I think she's a great mom or anything like that. (laughs) She's like, I like this particular kind of flower and that's enough. Yeah. But we still use flower symbology. The use of flowers in art express layers of meaning. It's been used in Chinese paintings and Hindu and Buddhist art. In Islamist art, human figures were not allowed. So oh. beautiful flowers were used to illuminate a manuscripts. We mm-hmm. had pre-Raphaelites in the 19th century. You know, this is post-Victorian era who are using flowers in paintings and in poetry and yes. literature to talk about things. Well, if you've seen President Obama's presidential portrait, Mm -hmm. There was a lot of controversy about this one because most presidential portraits are usually this staid, stodgy, neutral background. And then the president president is kind of. Yeah. And then he's kind of looking off into the middle distance. Well, (laughs) President Obama's painting was painted by Kehinde Wiley. It's got him seated on a wooden chair, and it's kind mm-hmm. of a casual looking, almost like a kitchen chair, in front of a, an entire background of green leaves. Okay. It's super bright. I mean, almost cartoony bright, how bright these leaves are behind him. Uh-huh. And so it's an intentional... 
look at this. Well, yeah. And in the background behind him, you can see there are flowers. There's sherbet pink and orange and yellow chrysanthemums, which were the official flower of Chicago. Okay. So it's kind of showing he's a community organizer Mm -hmm. and how he eventually became a senator. And then there's purple African blue lilies, which are a reminder of his father, who is a Kenyan. And that's what sets him apart Mm -hmm. from all the other men in the Hall of Presidents. The fact that, you know, Mm -hmm. here we have this black man who has now been a president. And at the same time connects him to people. Yes. Who have backgrounds that aren't all from here. And there's also a white jasmine, which is a Hawaiian favorite flower, and it's a reminder of where he grew up. And this Mm -hmm. painting has caused a lot of controversy, not just from the fact that it's not like every other painting, but because it has all these multiple layers of meanings that are a lot more obvious. You know, I could Mm -hmm. see where you could look at a presidential painting and be like, well, his tie has stripes that go to the left. You know, what does that say? But this one was like, I have things to say, and I'm going to spread it all Mm -hmm. over the, the portrait. I like the having the more common chair reminds me of in Indiana Jones where they're trying to pick which one is the chalice and it ends up being the more... uh, The super plain one. Yeah. He's a man of the people. Yeah. And I think that's what they were trying to get. Well, you know, you've got painting symbolism, but I just like the fact that floriography is Mm -hmm. still coming in there. And and it's it's not so much like this flower means this. Mm -hmm. This is these flowers represent something. Yes. I, in my digging, found a blurb on Pottermore.com, which is a fun Harry Potter site. And the person writing said that they feel like there is some floriography in the Harry Potter books because the first thing that Snape says to Harry ever in any of the books is, what would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? And the author cites asphodel as a type of lily, which means remembered beyond the tomb or my regrets follow you to the grave. And wormwood is often associated with regret or bitterness. And that definitely characterizes Snape's relationship. relationship. Mm -hmm. Wow. And Petunia Dursley and Lily Potter sisters. Petunia means susceptible to damage and best grown in a container or a basket, which Petunia definitely was this very traditional English wife. Oh, that's right. It also means resentment and anger, whereas Lily means beauty, elegance, and sweetness. That's a compelling argument to me. It could be totally coincidental, but I really do like those. I don't know. I think so. No, it's not. And there were others in there. So it would be fun to go through now. You reread and think um, J.K. Rowling is a very clever, layered thinking author. I like that. Well, I knew that. We already knew that. (laughs) J.K., when you listen to this, we love you. You're great. Well, let's make some uh, messages of our own. Excellent. What do dandelions mean? I've got some. I think I have that down here. (gasps) Do you? Before I get there. Okay. So let's see. We talked about the Victorian era. And you've got your messages, which could be positive, but they could also be negative because yeah. flowers had dual meanings depending oh, yeah. on is it blooming, is it a bud, you know, all these different oh. kinds of things. And often arrangements, or like you said, tussy mussies or nosegays, they could even be a bunch of herbs with a single flower. Oh, which uh, that is good. what I was reading some of the poor people would do because you could okay. get some rosemary and you could maybe yes. get a little local flower and mix those together. Mm-hmm. But as meanings changed and evolved, bouquets became more elaborate mm-hmm. and you could create multiple meanings. So I have made a few different ones. I used flower lore, the teachings of flowers, historical, legendary, poetical and symbolical. That is a big name. By Miss Carruthers, written in 1879. Okay. And I have a picture of the title plate. Excellent. On the website. It's quite lovely. So I uh, created a bouquet of betrayal. Ah, oh, excellent. So you have asphodel, which you mentioned already. Yes. Bramble, which is uh, like blackberry bramble, cherry blossoms, and hyacinth. So you played with my heart, gave me false hopes. You will be sorry. My regret will follow you to the grave. Wow. <laughs> Hyacinths are not? Oh. Well, so you have... They're not a nice one? Well, they're... Not, they're but see, they aren't nice. Depending but on But see, context. depending on how you... Okay. You stick them all together. Because you have asphodel, regrets will follow you to the grave. Mm-hmm. Bramble is for remorse. Cherry blossoms, false hopes. And oh. hyacinth can be games and sport and or woe. 
Okay. So when you stick them all together, that context means yeah. And there's also lots of room. I mean, you could probably use those same ones and make up a completely different sentence. But this is my game, so I win. That's right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm guessing by uh, the social tone in future interactions, you'd know what that bouquet meant. Yes, I'm not inviting you to my next party. So. Here's one. It's the never give up bouquet. You know, you're kind of low and things aren't going well. So I would send mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. zinnias, thoughts of absent friends, wallflower, faithful in adversity, rosemary for remembrance, and lily of the valley in, in this context, return of happiness. Aww. So what I'm saying to you is I'm thinking of you, my friend, be strong and don't give up. Soon mm-hmm. you will be happy again. That's nice. That's much better. Send it's, that one. It is much better. I'll send you that one. You don't want <laughs> you don't want the bouquet of betrayal. No. The only problem with some of these, and this is fun to put together, but not all of these flowers are in season all at the same time. Yes, yeah, so, so you have to have a serious greenhouse. Yeah. So some of these are probably technically not possible. Mm-hmm. You know, unless yeah. I don't know. My mom has mad skills. She tricks her Christmas cactus into blooming at the wrong season. Okay, so she's super proud of that. Maybe it is possible. It's unlikely. Improbable. So this one, I was imagining if I was a spy, nose gay. Yes. So I'm a spy, and we're we're communicating <gasps> with flower code. They do it when you read anything about floriography. Cryptography comes up because it is among those things. So I'm walking down the street in Paris, and a fellow agent hands me the nose gay. You know, yes. and then I have to whip out my flower dictionary and <laughs> translate because this bouquet has fennel. Strength and worthiness, dandelion, which oh. is an oracle. Oh, lily, eloquence, uh, Agnes Castus, which stands for command, almond, watchfulness, yeah. idlevice, daring and courage, nettle, slander, and thistle, defiance. So I've got Ooh. my bouquet and I look mm-hmm. at it all and I make sure I don't touch the nettle because it's yes. stinging. Be sorry. And Translate, be strong. You are commanded to use all your courage and daring to watch our enemies defy their slander with your eloquence. That sort of excellently war era, you can do it. Yeah. I like that. Go to Google, mm-hmm. Google flower, language of flowers. You can find lots of lists. Yeah, send us a message. We'll tell you what we think you mean. <laughs> oh, yes. Brain junk podcast at gmail.com. Go yeah. ahead. Send, send us, us some. Send us a message. We'll try to translate it. Nothing dirty. <laughs> Before we go, so you talked about what was the lady's name? Mary. Mary. <laughs> <laughs> back on page one with my small glasses. Come on, flip through your paper. Paper shuffling. Paper, paper. Lady Mary Wortley Montague. Oh, she has such a great name. It has to be said like that. I think. I agree. She went to. She was in Turkey. Yep. Well, one of the things she would have been seeing, Anatolia. Mm-hmm. is what we call Asia Minor today, which is mostly all yeah. of Turkey. Okay. And there is a group of people the that were the Anatolians. They were making this, it's either crocheted or knitted or laced. It's called Oya. It's a decorative edging, and mm-hmm. it's also called around the world Turkish lace. Yeah. Since the 12th century, and it's spread out around the world. And it's traditionally used to edge headdresses and scarves. So if you imagine mm-hmm. a lace or a crochet, and it's stitched onto the edge of a mm-hmm. scarf. So if you had it wrapped around your head or around your neck, you would have different kinds of flowers embroidered into this lace. Yes. So the women designed flowers into their oya, depending on their age, their love interest, their marriage status. <laughs> so you've got this chick walking past you, and an old lady might have tiny flowers because she's, you know, kind of telling you dust to dust. Oh, you know, yeah. These are little. I'm old. I'm kind of over it. A 40-year-old might have a bent tulip, so you know that she's still blooming, but eh, she's a little <laughs> over the hill, which I think is kind of mean. Yeah. That's what you do for your sister-in-law. Oh, <laughs> Stitch that up. Look Just, what I made you. Oh, thanks. Is there a, like a hey baby flower that your 16-year-old stitches instead of wearing the midriff shirt that, Yep, and they sneak out of the house? So girls engaged to marry a man they loved wore pink hyacinths and almond blossoms. Okay. If a new bride didn't like her husband, <laughs> she would make pepper spices in her <gasps> oya to say that her marriage was unhappy. Oh. Conversely, if you enjoyed your marriage you could put hot peppers in your oya oh really and they'd be like oh they got it going on (laughs) yeah so there was lots of communicating going on and an engaged girl is supposed to send a piece of this turkish lace to her future mother-in-law Ooh. 
flowers meant that they had a good relationship, a yeah. gravestone pattern or a hairy wolf. Now, this isn't flowers, but I had to talk about this because it's insulting <laughs> with art. Yeah. Uh, gravestone pattern or a hairy wolf would mean that the girl does not like the mother-in-law. Ooh. There were lots of different things they could put into this piece of lace. And it's supposed to be worn at the wedding. I believe the mother-in-law is supposed to wear this gift. And so... Oh, boy. Are you honest? You know, does did, did every mother-in-law just always get the flowers? Yeah, it was always flattering. I would think you would be... It would be in your best interest to... Oh, yeah. But maybe... Especially in societies with greater level of generational living. I would want... I would make... A really obsequiously flattering. Yeah. yeah. Although I was thinking, like, maybe the skill level. I don't know, but see, you'd want to oh, show. True. <laughs> you know, you'd want to show super skill level yeah. on these things because that's showing your capability as a future wife and all this sort of stuff. But mm-hmm. I'm wondering if there wasn't some sneaky mis messaging, you know, yes. going in there like it would look like flowers, but if you got really close, <laughs> maybe. You'd see, it was pepper blossoms hiding in there. Yeah, you know. You just hide know. one or two in a few spots. <laughs> mm hmm. <laughs> Poor mothers in law. Yep. Mine is lovely. Mine is great, too. Yeah. Shout out complain. to the mother-in-law. Except I'm not making her fancy lace. No, me either. She's the seamstress. She could make her own fancy lace. And yeah. then I could just tell people that I was morally supportive while she made it. Yes. <laughs> Please come visit us at brainjunkpodcast.com. We'll have pictures and more notes for you on these beautiful Oyas, these lacy headdresses and... The flower messages are up there. So take a look. This episode in particular is very beautiful to go visit the show notes. For this and other wonderful episodes, look for Brain Junk wherever you find your podcasts. And while you're there, iPhone listeners, don't forget to scroll down to the bottom and subscribe. We tweet at My Brain Junk, and you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Brain Junk Podcast. Amy and I will catch you next time when we share more of everything you never knew you wanted to know, and I guarantee you will not be bored.